the population sizes across time. And uh, uh, this uh, whole field of insect population dynamics had been uh, quite a dynamic uh, uh, field with a large amount of uh, theoretical innovations and uh, practical uh, 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 implementation uh, which has happened in managing the population of insects. So this is an area which has got uh, uh, both a uh, uh, very strong theoretical uh, background and also very, very important practical implications, uh, basically because we are in need of managing a large number of insect uh, pests. So I will uh, uh, put uh, on screen my uh, presentation for the day. I hope the screen is visible. Oh, no, sir. Uh, it's not visible. Has it come up? Not yet, sir. No, sir. Yes, and now we can see. Okay, I think it's visible now. Yes, sir, we can see. Okay, so uh, the topic for today is uh, insect population dynamics. Uh, uh, we have a we'll have a quick look at the major outbreaks uh, of insect. We we'll call it the outbreak. Uh, uh, the recent one, the locust outbreak, which uh, happened in uh, uh, the uh, western states of India, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, uh, which uh, completely uh, co covered an area of around uh, 2.5 to 3 kilometer. Uh, many of the crops were affected. Uh, the Rajasthan uh, had the most uh, severe impact with uh, nearly 1,49,000 uh, uh, hectares of crop damage in Rajasthan. And uh, severe crop damages was uh, occurred in uh, uh, neighboring state also with uh, Gujarat. Uh, nearly 18,000 hectares were damaged by the uh, locust swarms. Uh, the fall armyworms, Prodoptera frugipeda attack, uh, uh, which has happened in the past uh, nine months, uh, it has spread to nearly 10 Indian states. And uh, such is good, uh, which had the infestation in January 2019, uh, it has got a new report of this particular uh, pest. Uh, from in the southern state also, uh, from Karnataka, we ha in Karnataka we had the very first outbreaks, which has spread to uh, other states like Maharashtra and Gujarat, and now it is moving over to the uh, eastern Indian uh, states. Uh, up till now, uh, it has affected nearly thousand uh, seventy thousand hectares, well, like uh, seventy thousand hectares of uh, maize crops. Uh, and what is the causes of uh, these big uh, swamps of insects which come and damage our uh, agriculture? Uh, there are several environmental causes which have been assigned, uh, environmental change by way of increased temperature, uh, resulting in extension of the geographical range of pests and pathogens. Uh, basically, uh, the lifespan of an insect is uh, very solidly controlled by temperature. When the temperature increases, the lifespan uh, reduces. So when the temperature is on the up, there could be much more generations than uh, in a normal uh, year. Uh, one of the insects which I have uh, studied, uh, it normally goes to 13 and a half generation per year, but under increased temperature, it can go to 14 or even 15 generations per year. So when the number of generations increase, uh, there's every chance that some of the generations which has got good access to food can really cause uh, the outbreak uh, in, the, uh, in, in the field. And uh, another cause is the introduction of a new pest from outside. Uh, where the, when that happens, there will be no local uh, pathogens or uh, uh, natural enemies of that particular uh, insect right here. So there will be nothing to uh, hold on to or control the uh, population size and they become a pest. 
and the third is that uh, when you use uh, chemical pesticides uh, it kills the natural enemies also and the pest res uh, resurgence can happen and the fourth is that uh, many of the chemical pesticides which you had been using uh, can cause resistance uh, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, for the uh, pest and finally uh, we have a uh, high higher quality standards which we have uh, set up uh, for many of the uh, uh, crops, especially the crops which we are exporting, which uh, pre prevents us from using uh, uh, chemical pesticides. Uh, so uh, it is difficult to manage the size of the uh, pests uh, in the field itself. And if you look at the biology, insects are basically uh, called uh, called blooded, uh, which is uh, technically called as the poikilothermic organisms. Uh, they have to shed their uh, exoskeleton in order to grow, a process which we call as uh, molting. And uh, you might be knowing about the metamorphosis which happens. Uh, and they have large compound eyes, uh, which uh, uh, helps them to uh, detect movement uh, much faster. Antennae uh, are present for insects, which uh, help them to detect uh, chemical uh, signals. And the general body is divided into the head, thorax, and the uh, uh, abdomen. And this is the basic uh, structure of a, uh, of a uh, typical insect. Uh, uh, here on screen is a model insect from the group uh, Orthoptera. And uh, uh, basically, this structure has been uh, tested uh, time and again and found that it is very adaptive to very different uh, conditions. So uh, I'll not be going to the morphology of insects in a big way. But one thing which you need to uh, look at is a, a thing called spiracles. The spiracles are small openings along the uh, segment. And so that uh, uh, increases the efficiency of insect as an organism. So uh, it can uh, outperform uh, uh, many fields than uh, uh, human beings. Uh, they can uh, jump much longer distances uh, than its body size. Uh, it can fly long hours. Uh, so all these uh, capabilities are because of the basically because of the intricate uh, body design. And the life stages, uh, uh, where it's a complete metamorphosis happens, uh, it goes from egg, larva, pupa, and the adult. <laughs> and uh, uh, there are other insects which doesn't have a metamorphosis also, except for the silverfish, which you find in your library, in, inside your books. Uh, and they are also called as ametabolists. They do uh, go for a uh, metamorphosis process. And there's other insects which go for a gradual metamorphosis, like the grasshoppers and the uh, uh, crickets. And uh, there are other cases with which uh, there's an incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, there is, uh, there'll be only just uh, three stages, the egg, the nymph, and the adult. The pupil stage will be uh, totally absent. Uh, the examples are dragonflies, which are all also called as hemimetabolous. And uh, this is a complete metamorphosis, which has got the four stages, egg, larvae, pupae, and adult, normally seen in uh, most of the insects, including the butterflies, moths. Uh, and uh, uh, the population uh, is a, basically defined as a uh, large group of individuals of the same species, which lives together. And the population dynamics basically looks like the fluctuations of, uh, of the size of the population, uh, which is uh, quantified uh, in this particular equation. So population change per unit of time is equal to the birth rate, uh, the addition of insects, minus the death rate, the loss of insects, plus the immigration rate, the number of insects which comes to a particular location, uh, minus the immigration rate, the number of insects which has uh, left the particular uh, space. And uh, it is uh, as well as uh, delta n is equal to b minus d plus uh, i minus e, basically birth rate minus death rate, uh, plus uh, immigration uh, rate minus immigration rate. Uh, uh, so what? Uh, essentially, this equation means is that the population density increases when individual births and uh, immigration exceed the set uh, migration. So in, we can call us from when B plus I is greater than D plus E, the population increases. And it declines when it is uh, uh, less from the birth rate and the immigration is less than the death and immigration, the population uh, decreases. And uh, if both are the same, the population uh, remains in an equilibrium. Uh, so this is the relationship. 
uh, is a uh, natality, the mortality, uh, immigration, immigration. So natality adds to the population size. Immigration adds to the population size. Mortality reduces the population size, and immigration also reduces the uh, population size. And uh, we have uh, uh, the theoretical uh, concept of uh, population dynamics have classified uh, uh, insect outbreaks into many different categories. And this is the first one, the sustained gradient outbreaks. When populations remain consistently high in certain favorable environments. So this is a low level where an insect population density is plotted against time. And this is a moderate one, and this is a high level. The population remains at a particular level continuously for a, a period of time. Example is the pine plantations on relatively dry sites. They have a, a, a favorable environment for short moss. Consequently, shoot damage has to consistently higher on these sites. Uh, so when that happens, the impact will be consistent and re uh, remaining for a long period of time. The second is a cyclic, uh, cyclical gradient outbreaks occur when favorable environments amplify the population cycles caused by delayed density dependent uh, feedbacks. And uh, they exhibit regular periodic outbreaks in uh, environments. Uh, the, uh, they are basically cyclical. They reappear at a, uh, a particular period of time. For example, there are, there, there's a regularity. Usually uh, every eight to 11 years, you get a uh, big buildup of the population. And uh, uh, their tendency to be synchronized over relatively large areas, they get uh, synchronized. Uh, they normally this cycle happens in the same location at uh, uh, regular uh, intervals. They do not spread far from the points of origin and usually associated with uh, defoliating insects like Lepidoptera. Uh, these outbreaks are normally terminated by natural enemies or host defensive uh, responses. And this is the way it happens. Uh, environmental favorability, uh, uh, when it increases, uh, the insect population uh, moves to a particular a uh, cyclical pattern. So you have a, a big outbreak over here, it collapses and then it again happens and this becomes a cyclical phenomenon. And then we have the eruptive outbreaks. Uh, they are induced irregular intervals, but the cycl cyclical outbreaks were the uh, uh, regular uh, uh, in frequency. These eruptive outbreaks are irregular and uh, they are caused by temporary changes in uh, 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 environment. Uh, and they uh, elevate the population densities above the un uh, unstable thresholds or are continuous in uh, high favorable environments. Uh, they, whenever there's an eruptive outbreak, we normally observe an epicenter, a small place where there's high intensity uh, insects, uh, density of insects, which uh, erupt from there and uh, spread to larger areas causing uh, outbreaks. <coughs> And uh, this is how it uh, uh, happens. There's a uh, lower level, and then there's a moderate level at which you get a uh, uh, outbreak once in a while, and then it sustains. Uh, but then, uh, unlike uh, uh, either, it can go up and sustain at a high level, or it crashes and then uh, come up again. Uh, but this uh, uh, this is a quite regular uh, thing. Uh, and when it happens, uh, uh, it it it, it is classified into two or uh, uh, two types of which are outbreaks that cause the death of a large percentage of their host a plant population and they are rapidly suppressed by natural enemies. This is there's just one pulse uh, which is happening, which should be completely uh, 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 managed by the response of the host organism or by the increase in natural enemies. But then there could also be sustained eruptions. A eruption happens, happens and then it uh, gets uh, uh, sustained uh, for a long period of time. So this is going to be uh, much more uh, impactful on the host uh, uh, plant. And uh, we have cyclical eruptions, uh, uh, which I have told you earlier, and there are permanent eruptions, possibly if uh, natural enemies of whole diseases are completely ineffective. Like for example, for in invasive insects, insects which has come to us and have created uh, a problem without the uh, natural enemies over here, they can sustain the eruptions which has happened. And uh, you come to population regulation. How is the normal, uh, po normally the population regulated uh, in the environment? Structured this with feedback mechanisms to increase or decrease density to where the uh, K. So basically, uh, there are two different types of population regulation which happens. One is the density dependent uh, regulation. So when the density is very high, uh, it is not sustainable, it uh, uh, goes down. And then there is the density independent uh, 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 regulation, 
where uh, the regulation, if ever it happens, is because of abiotic factors like temperature, humidity, rainfall, uh, etc. And it is not based on the density of the, uh, it is not related to the density of the uh, insect. So uh, uh, when the rate of birth or death uh, increases, uh, uh, it causes a large level of uh, uh, Im uh, impacts and uh, the crash can happen. But it can also uh, uh, increase when uh, uh, the density dependent factors, the factors which affect the population dynamics uh, are on the uh, or decline. <clears throat> Normally, this is what happens. The number of in insects, when it uh, go towards the carrying capacity, it reaches uh, when the population increases from here. Uh, initially, the population grows rapidly, and then the growth rate uh, slows down. It uh, reaches a plateau, and uh, the growth stabilizes around uh, the carrying capacity of that particular uh, population. Now, density are uh, dependent factors, a factor that causes higher mortality or reduced birth rates as the population becomes more dense. Uh, and uh, there could be two uh, uh, a positive feedback uh, loop. Uh, these are some examples of the density dependent effects, like uh, uh, when the density increases, uh, there could be physiological factors which work against it. There could be competition which is happening. There could be uh, territoriality, uh, which uh, uh, which completely uh, uh, restricts the population, and uh, the environment becomes uh, unfavorable. And disease could happen when when the density is very high and the, there's a you know, incidence of a disease. It spreads very fast, and predation will also increase because there is a large amount of prey. It is easy for the predator to uh, uh, to access it. So these are the density dependent factors which uh, reduces the population uh, size. And uh, the density dependence, the uh, factor that causes higher mortality or reduced birth rates as a population becomes more dense, that's what's called as the density dependence. It could be uh, disease, uh, as I told you earlier, uh, either the supply of food, the predation, and territorial uh, behavior. <clears throat> and uh, we come to the density independent factors. They limit populations regardless of the density. Uh, the examples are climate, weather, floods, fire, Pesticide use, pollutants, and uh, over hunting. hunting. So basically, there are two different ways in which a population is regulated. One is the uh, density dependent factors, and the other is the density independent factors. Uh, there's no association with population density. They act on a population independent of the density. So this is basically the uh, theoretical uh, structure. I would like to also introduce this uh, term called meta population. It was coined by Richard Levins in 1970. It is defined as the set of local populations that persists in a balance between stochastic local extinctions and establishment of new local populations. The, a meta population is a group of different populations between which uh, there is movement of uh, organisms happening. So uh, what it essentially means that uh, a local population can uh, uh, either go extinct or uh, a new place can be uh, recolonized, but the meta population remains almost stable, while the local populations are very erratic. We'll come to the practical implications of that later. And uh, the local population is basically closed one, while the meta population is an open population. So group of uh, same individuals living in the same place at the same time uh, is constitute the local population. While the group of same individual living in uh, different places at the same time, those meta populations are much more uh, spatially big uh, space in which uh, there are different populations uh, uh, living uh, together. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of local populations, uh, the individuals are added only by birth uh, and uh, lost uh, because of death. In the case of meta population, uh, the individuals are added through immigration and the loss is through immigration. Uh, uh, so the interaction in the case of a local population happens within uh, that particular population. But in the case of meta population, uh, migration from one local to uh, local population to other uh, is possible. And this is basically the uh, meta population model. I will not be going to the details of that right now to do to a positive of time. So this is a basic structure of a uh, meta population. It's a local population. There are three local populations over here, but there is movement happening of individuals across the populations, and we call the bigger structure as a meta population. For the meta populations, the first one is that the species has local breeding populations or largely discrete habitat patches. 
And the second is that no single local population is large enough to have a long expected lifetime in comparison with the expected lifetime of the meta population. Thirdly, the habitat patches are not too isolated to prevent recolonization, which necessarily means that there should be a possibility of movement between the local populations. Uh, and the last condition is that the local dynamics are sufficiently asynchronous to make simultaneous extinction of all local populations unlikely. Uh, it essentially means that all the local populations uh, uh, should be uh, should not be synchronous and uh, 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 should not uh, go extinct all of a sudden together. Uh, there should be a sufficient asynchronous uh, 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 dynamics present so that even if one local population is extinct, others uh, survive. And uh, these are uh, the, some of the classic uh, meta population models. I'll not be going to the details of that right now. I'll come to one of the models which I had been working on, uh, which is the teak defoliator. This is an insect uh, called as the, the Hiblia pura. Uh, uh, it's a lepidoptera uh, moth, uh, which is uh, mostly seen in uh, South, uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, this is the life cycle. Uh, it has got a, there's a uh, there's a egg-laying process which happens on the tender teak leaf foliage, uh, and uh, it emerges into larval instars, and it molds. Uh, there are five different larval instars, which causes the defoliation of the teak tree, and then it pupates on the ground. Uh, and if it's a rainy period, it uh, pupates on the uh, by folding the leaf of the uh, plants which are uh, living under under uh, canopy. And then it emerges uh, in a week, it emerges to uh, the moth. The whole life cycle completes in uh, 19 to 21 days. Uh, and uh, small changes can happen based on the ambient uh, temperature. And the minimum number of days is 19, and the maximum uh, is 36. We had compared the lifespan of insects in uh, Kerala, in Bangalore, and in uh, Dharadun, three places with uh, different uh, temperature regimes. And we find that uh, the Dharadun population took uh, 36 days for completing one generation. In 19 days. And the ecological relationships at uh, this oligophagus, it has got, uh, it feeds on nearly 29 host plants, uh, and mostly they are trees. But uh, teak is a major host in the sense that teak uh, plantations uh, are extensive. In Kerala, we have more than 75,000 hectares under teak, so there's enough food supply available for this particular uh, insect. And uh, looking at the natural Uh, predators. It has got 34 insect parasites, including 15 from the dipteran group and uh, 19 from hymenopteran group, uh, has been recorded for the tick defoliator. Uh, there's a highly complex uh, web of interaction between the parasites uh, uh, and the uh, and the host insect. And the insect para uh, parasites have a significant influence on the dynamics of Hiblepura during the non outbreak uh, period. Predators of this particular uh, large case, uh, the bats, there are many predator species. And there are pathogens also. There are two bacteria that had been identified. One is the BG, the other one is Enterobacter aerogens. Uh, and will be found on the top branches in an inverted V uh, shape. Uh, so that's a classical uh, uh, symptom of a virus induced death in a uh, moth. And uh, when you come to couple the population, that in Kerala, uh, but it's delayed until July in uh, uh, in the central part of Kerala and the northern parts of India. And uh, the uh, we have a very small uh, epicenters to start with, which expands to bigger areas. Uh, in every generation. Uh, uh, there will be nearly 15 million moths per hectare uh, uh, to produce one generation. And uh, the seasonal incidence uh, is uh, depicted in the graph over here. Uh, there are cases, uh, we get a uh, peak 
outbreak period. And you can see over here, during starting from uh, May, June, we have got small epicenter populations. And then during the monsoon period, uh, starting from June, July, you get a big uh, peak of uh, outbreaks. And in some years, we get a second peak during the northeastern monsoon. Okay. Okay. I'll take a small bit. One second. Hello, I'm back. Oh, sorry for that. Uh, no, what has actually happens is that uh, 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 tea because you know, uh, is a distant tree. During November to December, there will be absolutely no leaves on the uh, on the plant, so there will be no insects found. By uh, with the pre monsoon showers, which happens in the late February, we get the uh, new flush on the tea tree, and uh, by the end of February and early March, you get small outbreaks. Uh, uh, small, what we call as the epicenters. It will be small in area, less than five hectare in area, but there will be intense amount of uh, insects over there. So that's uh, after that generation, they spread to larger areas, and uh, parasites will be very active during this particular period. But then uh, they are not able to uh, uh, prevent an outbreak of the uh, insect. And uh, uh, we have studied both the dynamics of the insect. In both in space. In time, as I told earlier, uh, I have described what happens in uh, the temporal uh, dimension. In space, what happens is that uh, there will be a small uh, uh, phase. transform into uh, the uh, uh, outbreak phase uh, or the epidemic uh, phase where the large areas are being uh, infested. So uh, so this is what is happening in, uh, 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 in Kerala. And uh, we have observed that the very first outbreaks happens in the southern part of Kerala. And there's a gradual spread of the outbreaks uh, towards north. Uh, and uh, this follows very closely with the movement of the monsoon also. So this is about the details. And this is an existing model. There's a natural shower here. There could be most coming from uh, the natural forest to start in infestation uh, in the population. And uh, the moss which is emerging from the small natural forest or plantation can move over to uh, the uh, plantations and uh, can cause uh, patchy outbreaks. And uh, this patchy outbreaks can uh, in turn lead to larger outbreaks uh, killing of uh, 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 of vegetation on the tree. And uh, one thing which is uh, very interesting is that uh, 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 whenever moss emerge from a particular site, they invariably uh, migrate to new locations. They don't uh, stay there. And this is one way in which uh, they have uh, uh, the parasite population, which has been built up over the years. <coughs> And uh, I'll not be going to the assumptions. And from the management point of view, looking at the population dynamics is extremely important to understand uh, 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 to manage the uh, insect. For example, we have developed this particular virus, which I have been explained earlier, into a biopesticide, which is called as a heat check. Now, what we are having a, a model uh, to control the insect is to target the epicenter population. So epicenter populations are the populations between the endemic and the uh, uh, epidemic phase of the uh, population. So in the epicenter, it will deliver the virus. And the beauty of this virus is that uh, it can uh, it will magnify once you spray it in the field. Every insect which is imbibing the virus, uh, the virus spread, uh, uh, multiplies within the body, and the large amount of virus is released to the uh, environment. So that will be affecting the other insects, which has been not been affected when you did the spray. So there's a horizontal transmission happening. And if ever any larvae does, doesn't get the uh, required dosage of the virus, what happens is that uh, it will remain and it from one generation to the next generation. And so what we do is to uh, have a uh, to give a uh, sub-lethal dose of the virus uh, in the 
uh, epicenter the population so that the moths which are emerging from that particular population becomes carriers of the virus they will not be dead but they will be carriers so that whenever uh, they interact with moths which are immigrating to that, that particular area uh, when they mate the offspring uh, will be automatically killed because of the transmission of the virus and the vertical transmission uh, happens uh, in two ways it can the virus can remain in the surface of the egg or it can be within the egg also the transovum and the transovarian modes of uh, vertical transmission so this is the case where the uh, population dynamics uh, uh, helps us to uh, to manage a pest in the easiest um, method possible because when the big outbreaks happen it is extremely difficult to take planets because it's a large uh, amount of area and you will have to go for the uh, aerial mode of application but in epicenter you can uh, do the spraying from the ground you will be using a absolutely safe uh, target specific uh, bacillus virus to do the spray and you can prevent the uh, insect outbreaks thank you thank you for the patient care thank you so much sir for sharing so much information about insect population dynamics so there is one question in the chat box would you like to take that Fine. question Yeah, yeah, I'll have yeah. a look at it. Uh, what is the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Oh, okay. Uh, fine. Uh, there are many, very interesting. Uh, uh, you know, the antenna of a butterfly. It will be straight, uh, simple, and there's a small bulb-like uh, uh, thing, uh, uh, bulge at the end of the uh, antenna. Uh, but if you look at the antenna of a moth, it will be completely different. It will be just like a leaf or a uh, or a or a feather. It will be branched. Uh, so uh, the single most important uh, uh, criteria is to look at uh, uh, the uh, uh, the antenna. There are other other uh, changes also, uh, differences also. Uh, when you uh, see a uh, uh, butterfly uh, sitting on a uh, uh, resting, it will have its. Uh, Uh, wings uh, spread horizontally to the ground, but when the moths are there, it will be closing the wings uh, on top of them. And moths are generally dull colored, and butterflies are brightly colored. And moths are quite active during the uh, night, and butterflies are active uh, during the uh, daytime. But then, watertight compartment. There are other groups of there are some group of insects which have got the characters of the butterflies and the moths, uh, especially the group called uh, skippers. Uh, a group of insects which uh, come under the group Hesperidae. So they are basically having characters of both the uh, groups. I hope I have answered. Yes, sir. thank you so much, sir. So we'll not be taking any more questions because you are busy today. So thank you so much for taking out uh, uh, of your time, for taking out time from your busy schedule. So. Thank you so much on yeah. behalf of Ecology and Environment Science Department. Yeah, thank, thank you, Captain. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, best wishes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ramamurthy, sir. Thank you. 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 Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm extremely uh, uh, constrained over time. Sorry for that. No so, any questions you can mail me. You can access uh, my email ID from uh, up and up. Thank you all. Good sir. Thank you. Welcome sir. Up and now. Yes sir. Okay, I'll. Do you meet you in the afternoon? Huh? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank all you. the very best. Ah, fine. Most of the pleasure of mine. Okay. For the certificates. Okay. See you Take tomorrow. Care. With another oh. new session. Thank you. No, no. Today at two or two o'clock, no. Another session. Take care. All the best.